Good evening, everybody. Tonight, we have the pleasure of meeting with Bob O'Connell. And I've known Bob at least 20 years, and he has been an art insurance adjuster for a long time. And that's a concept that, you know, I didn't initially comprehend. When, and Bob can explain this further, but when somebody has an art insurance claim, frequently the insurance companies would call in someone to mediate that and to make sure that the claim was legitimate because the art, the insurance company typically didn't quite know what they were doing. So, you know, it, it, it would be sometimes hard to tell us what Bob would do that. As a result of which, he ended up in all kinds of fabulous situations that I think reveal a lot of the things that go on in the art world, some of which are shenanigans that I want to talk about, um, you know, because I think it sheds a fair amount of light on how the art world functions, etc. Hi, Bob. Hi, Paul. So um, you function work out of Chicago, but you spend a lot of time on an airplane. You went to school in Southern California. Did you ever think you were an artist when you were a kid, when you were in high school, etc.? I appreciated art. My father was a political cartoonist, and uh, he could draw photorealistically like my siblings could. So I decided that I wanted to appreciate art, so I kind of got myself into um, art history. Did you major in art history in college? Undergrad was English and history, master's degree in art history. So how did you how did you find your path? And one of the things we talk about in this course is how there are many different art villages. And you know, you've had your feet in more than one art village over over periods of time. How did you come to enter the art world? Did you automatically go out and say, I want to work in the art insurance industry? Or how did this happen? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I guess I owe a lot of it to Joseph Campbell. Um, when he was uh, being interviewed by uh, Bill Moyers, I was in uh, graduate school, and uh, the mantra was, follow your bliss. So I remember finishing undergrad and people saying, what are you going to do with that degree, teach? And then when I went to graduate school and got my art history degree, people said, what are you going to do, teach? And I think I just followed the path um, that led me through several jobs until I ran into some people I went to college with, and I became an insurance adjuster, which I never heard of in my life, and really people don't go to college to become insurance adjusters. So I started doing every insurance claim conceivable from automobile accidents to slip and fall in grocery stores to mysterious disappearance to death claims, product liabilities. And the company I worked for was sold to a British company who then asked if anyone had an expertise out of general property and casualty. And I raised my hand and the normal snicker went through the room, oh, that art guy. <laughs> and uh, ever since then, I've been working for Lloyd's and US companies for 25 years had my own business for 18 years, and uh, it's a path that I uh, enjoy. It's never boring. It's always different, and uh, when I think I've seen it all, tomorrow I'll see something brand new. So let's talk for a second about some of the mundane things that you would do. I mean, I remember that you and I got to know each other because you, when someone would become um, a customer, a client of an art insurance enterprise, frequently they would send somebody out to inspect the premises to see what their risk might be and to mitigate the risk, right? Did you, what kind of people would, what kind of clients would you go see? Uh, that type of work falls under the loss control or risk management aspect and primarily uh, I get hired by Lloyd's. U.S. insurance companies use their own people who are experts at boiler and machinery, experts at uh, workers' comp claims to come to their galleries and do a risk assessment, which most of them don't understand what they're looking at. But from my standpoint with Lloyd's, uh, they would send me out to a gallery, a museum, a private collection, uh, an art handler, a storage facility, anybody who would have art potentially at risk, and I would assess the risk on behalf of the interested underwriters at Lloyd's and write a report and make recommendations, 
which those recommendations had to be complied with within 30 days or Lloyd's would cancel their policy. Yeah, that's how we met when you came to inspect my gallery and told me that I had to get some of my stored art up off the floor and that I should, thank you so much, um, have a battery backed wireless way to communicate with the um, fire uh, police department, fire department in case there was a break in, which cost me some money and I had to do that right in 30 days. And we became friends because I vowed to get even, but we became friends first. So. Well, uh, yes, and 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 we also met um, we also met uh, on the lovely Kaneko thing. Indeed. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I should have just said that claim. That's right. Um, all right. Now, can we talk about certain kinds of things like Sylvester Stallone, for example? Sure. We can talk about Carl Hammer or Ron Hoffman. Anybody you. Now, let's talk about Sly. Let's talk about Sylvester Stallone. Now, my recollection was is that there was um, damage to some... Are you reading some... my book right now? Have you written it yet? <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. Um, Botero, Ferdinand Botero, a Colombian artist who made large sculptures of, still does, of large people and paintings. Tell the story, Bob. Well, uh, Sylvester Stallone... Um, had a home in uh, Los Angeles in, Ma in the Malibu area during the 94 Northridge earthquake. And shortly after the earthquake, he moved down to Vizcaya down in the Miami area. And he put a claim in for damages to a Botero uh, larger than life bronze and also a Rodin, a fabulous well, Rodin. Okay, cool, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's, let's, this, this is another wrinkle in the art world. Why would he put a claim in? W weren't the pieces restored perfectly? Well, actually, the pieces weren't restored. He claimed that they got damaged. I know, but let's assume they were for okay. the purpose of, I mean, wasn't the art that he had in his possession in perfect condition? Allegedly. Under what conditions would one could one file a claim for lost value when they still have the art in good shape? Uh, usually a diminution in value will follow any conservation efforts. So if conservation can't work or doesn't work or the object's completely destroyed, then you have no diminution in value. It's usually post-conservation. Yeah, but the notion is, is that the piece of art is no longer 100% of what it was, even if it looks like it. It may have some added material that reduces the value by some percent. The, the integrity by some percent and correspondingly the value, right? Correct. Okay, go so, ahead. So the goal, so the goal in diminution in value, is to give a amount that would make the artist or collector, whoever owns the piece, whole. So if it's a two hundred fifty thousand dollars sculpture and it has damage that's restored, then uh, a methodology is is prepared to figure out what the diminution in value would be post-conservation if the piece were to be sold today. So okay. a lot of times people are received the, the work of art back, restored, conservation is paid for, and then they receive a 50% monetary diminution in value to compensate them or whatever the number may be. Okay. So what happened? Well, well, uh, Stallone had put a claim in for da for damages to both of the pieces, and oops, I'm going to pull up a bow tower. There you go. Oh, nice. Ours was actually a, a vertical. I know, but that's go nice. Ahead. So, um, so what was interesting was that um, uh, Stallone. Uh, claimed that both pieces were damaged and, and uh, could not be restored. He was actually looking for a total loss. And I had taken a, a bronze expert with me who ran a foundry in Miami. And we took measurements of both the Botero and the Rodin. And as we were preparing to decide whether or not they could be restored, we noticed that the height, width, and depth of both sculptures did not did not match any of the catalog resume for Rodin or contacted Botero Studio, and the sizes were wrong. So further investigation. 
Further investigation, we determined that what Stallone had purchased from a dealer were copies uh, that were pulled from originals. They were Are you sure that that's what you determined? I thought it was determined that when they were restored, somebody cast the originals and made a duplicate and gave him the duplicate. I don't know. We don't know how. We know he got them from a dealer, but we just determined that his were fakes. Right. And uh, he and public adjuster, which is like a plaintiff law, plaintiff's lawyer, uh, wanted total losses. And because we determined that they were fakes, we didn't pay him anything. And then uh, probably about a month later, I read in the newspaper that Stallone had sued his um, dealer. Oh, his dealer. So we assume that, it, but we don't know how it resolved itself. We don't know for a hundred percent certain that the dealer was at fault and that it wasn't the that or that it was yeah that it wasn't the conservator. Correct. Person, yeah. Okay. This is but this is evidence of the kind of um, strange activities that can happen in the or probably any world that when you're dealing with high value. Um, but in this case, this is the art world, and part of what I want you guys to realize is is that though it seems like every single person we encounter in the art world is honest and reputable and scrupful, that's not a word, um, you know, that they're all good people, it isn't necessarily so. What other stories do we want to talk about, Bob, that illustrate this further? Well, one point I want to make about what you just said is is having spent most of my adult life in this career is um, probably 99% of the people in the insurance world know nothing about art. And probably the same percentage of people in the art world don't know much about insurance. So it's an, it's an interesting uh, set of bedfellows where insurance companies are insuring art and yet they don't understand it. And a lot of People who have insurance policies don't read them because they're complex uh, documents written by lawyers. Um, so it, it's 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 rather an interesting niche to work in, where I tell people that I feel like I'm bilingual because I speak art and speak insurance. But um, you know, damage is one damage is one thing, but th there tends to be uh, an issue that occurs in the art world with insurance companies in that um, there's a lot of white collar crime and the art crime is the one crime that's rarely prosecuted uh, because insurance companies do not want to sue people uh, most of the time because it creates a public record and so um, one of the one of the biggest cases uh, if most people are familiar with Isabella Stewart Gardner which has been in the newspaper recently um, back in 1990 on, on St. Patrick's Day, uh, two guys dressed up as police officers uh, went into Isabella Stewart Gardner and ripped out of the frames 13 major paintings worth $500 million. Um, so that was, an, that was uninsured. They had no insurance and people have been looking for those paintings since 1990. But there's a there's a lot of people who steal art. There's a lot of people who forge and and uh, try to pass off art to insurance companies. And probably the biggest fraud in the United States was Dr. Stephen G. Cooperman. And uh, Dr. Cooperman, uh, long story short, lives in lived lived in Bel Air, California, and had lent to the L.A. County Museum a Monet and a Picasso. And L.A. County had issued a um, loan agreement to him, and on the loan agreement, he put values of five million and seven point five million when both paintings were never worth more than three million. And uh, he had his family on vacation on the East Coast when somebody uh, went into his home and took just those two paintings. There was no sign of forced entry. The FBI, the po local police, myself, who investigated it, we all. We all knew that this was um, was fake, but we couldn't prove it. And uh, we ended up going to trial, and we had to pay Cooperman 12.5 million plus 7 million of punitive damages. Why punitive? Because you guys impugned his character? Because we, under California law, we we refused to pay the claim, and due to bad faith statute, um, we tried to make arguments that 
he needed the money that he had sold his medical practice and was being sued for malpractice, uh, 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 inflating the value and was being sued for medical malpractice. So the judge said that basically the issue was that he put $12.5 million down on his own insurance policy based on the certificates of insurance that he secured from LA County. And those certificates have the values, but on the back of every insurance certificate says, this is not a, an appraisal, not meant to be an appraisal, and shame on you if you treat it as an appraisal. But his insurance company charged him a premium for two paintings at 12 and a half million. The judge ruled, you took his money, you gotta pay, you gotta pay. It doesn't matter about his character, you have to still have to pay the claim. But um, five years later, we discovered the paintings in a storage locker in Cleveland. We had gotten a tip from a socialite in Cleveland named Pam Davis, who uh, was dating a lawyer who had worked for Cooperman named um, James Little. And uh, he showed her the paintings and then he broke up, up with her. And um, she turned him in. So the FBI uh, arrested him and told him he was going to prison for transporting stolen property cross state lines because he had put it on his household goods move from California to Cleveland. His dad was a federal judge at the time. So they cut a deal that he was going to turn in a guy named James Tierney, who at the time of the theft was the state's attorney for California. And Jim Little wore a wire according to the FBI. And the FBI told me it was just like in the movies, they sat across the street from a restaurant with uh, canned headphones on recording the conversation between Little and, and Tierney. And uh, they said they were laughing so hard because Tierney was patting Little down trying to find a wire. And thank, thank you for technology that they now have wireless suppository um, devices. <laughs> That's our federal tax dollars at work. So uh, they, they got Tierney on tape admitting to being the one who went into Cooperman's house with a key and took those two paintings. So they told Tierney he was going to go to prison, and Tierney gave up Cooperman. Uh, so Cooperman's been in prison, but to this day, we're still missing $17.5 million. Wow. So you have stories like, huh? The kids at home, crime does pay. <laughs> there you go. So, but you have stories like this all the time. All right, let's segue to Katrina. Oh, Katrina. Well, Katrina and most hurricanes, there's there's tremendous loss uh, involved with museums, galleries, and private collections. Uh, one of the claims in Katrina that we worked on was for a very famous uh, photo dealer in New Orleans, uh, a gallery for fine photography owned by Joshua Mann Palet, and um, he did not have much damage in the French Quarter, but he had an offsite storage uh, facility that had uh, flat files and storage. And he, his storage was, like we talked about, Paul, it started six inches off the ground and then it went all the way up to the ceiling. So he had enough spillage, as we call it, off the ground, but the uh, storage unit was completely underwater. So by the time we had crowbarred our way in there and started going through everything, uh, pretty much everything in there was a complete total loss. There were some things that we could salvage from that, but the um, the catastrophes, the hurricanes like Katrina are really taxing because there's not a lot of, uh, a lot of times there's not electricity, you can't control temperature and humidity. So in many instances, we have to move things out of state to try to save them. But Katrina was was really, a very difficult uh, uh, hurricane. Now, how many, I thought you spent. I thought you spent a ton of time wearing gas masks and you know rubber boots and you know avoiding the the, the, the toxic mold that was in etc. Not so or what? No, we, we we did that. We worked with respirators and gloves uh, with tremendous amounts of mold, um, but you know every every catastrophe, it doesn't have to be a hurricane, you're dealing with those issues. We we worked several years ago at the University of Iowa. The, that's the next one I wanted to go to, yeah, go ahead. The, the entire, the entire uh, art building, the museum, 
it looks a lot like a uh, Mies van der Rohe Farnsworth house. It uh, was one story with glass with marble floors. And um, we. Yeah, but the one pink one I have doesn't work in Ken's printer, so Allison's going to print. We, we, were, we, were, we were advised by Lloyd to meet. I met with the University of Iowa, the Board of Regents, the museum people to try to convince them to move out the 25 most valuable works of art prior to the flood. And it's the first time in 25 years that I have worked in this business that an underwriter has agreed to pay before a loss happens. And so we finally got the agreement because the Army Corps of Engineers was releasing water from the dams that we knew that the museum would be underwater within 48 hours. So they gave us a list of their 25 most valuable paintings that included a Jackson Pollock mural that was roughly 10 feet high by 14 feet across. And just, that's it, right? <laughs> that is it, yes. And how, uh, how thick was the paint on this thing? It, the paint was lots of epoxy and varnish on top of it. In fact, that painting weighed so much that when we took it off the cleat and put it on sawhorses to actually do the condition report before we packed it and moved it, um, there's tremendous sag in that painting when you're sitting on sawhorses. But the interesting thing about this painting, if you're not aware of this painting, uh, it was actually a painting that Peggy Guggenheim had purchased from Pollock, and then she couldn't get it into her home in New York. So she gave it to Philip Gustin. Nice. She gave it to Philip Gustin, and uh, Philip actually was teaching at the University of Iowa. They had taken it off the stretcher bars and rolled it up, and it sat behind a bookcase for about 40 years. Nobody knew, remembered what it was. The painting... Nice. The painting conservatively at the time of the loss was insured for uh, somewhere around uh, $100 million. And when the, the Iowa legislature found out that this painting had been removed and went to Chicago to be in storage, when it came back, we installed it at the Davenport, uh, the Figgy Museum in Davenport. Uh, the state legislature passed a law saying that those were state state assets, and they passed a House bill that gave the uh, Iowa government the right to sell that piece to help balance the budget. And it created such a outrage in the art world, <coughs> excuse me, that um, they stopped them from trying to sell the painting, but they were planning on selling that painting. Well, um you had difficulty convincing the University of Iowa that their art was at risk, yes? Correct. How high did the water come up on this painting on the wall behind it when the, after the painting had been removed? I have pictures. I have pictures of the uh, painting after we removed it where half of the sheetrock was taken off because of mold. So if the painting would have stayed there, we couldn't get in for 10 days after the museum was covered. So 50% of that painting would have been underwater for at least 10 days. All of that paint would have been off the painting. The painting would have been ruined forever. We also had a Max Backmon triptych. We had a Robert Motherwell. We had incredible paintings that we had to move out. But the African collection and a lot of the paintings and things that were left behind in the vault we had to go in there with headlight headlamps on, with no electricity, with, with respirators and hazmat suits, and getting people to cut the sheetrock off and start to take everything out. We, we moved all the 25 paintings to Terry Dowd's for safekeeping. And Who's then Terry Dowd? Terry Dowd uh, owns uh, Terry Dowd Inc., which is a fine art handler and storage in Chicago, and they also have a location in Denver. So we stored the 25 most valuable pieces at Terry Dowd's. Terry has a second location besides the one on Armitage. So we decided to store all of the African and organic material at Terry's that was damaged. And then we had a third location for non-organic material 
we didn't want to cross contaminate. It took about a year to restore everything. And what's the condition of the museum now? Uh, the last that I heard that they are never going to use that building, that one-story building for a museum. I think they're going to use it for for modern dance or some other type of art. And they're looking for a home on the high side, on the south side of the river, to try to have a temporary location for the museum. Um, but there hasn't been anything that I'm aware of that's fully committed to because of money. Is this art still in storage? Everything is in probably three or four locations on campus, on high ground, and they're they're working with some temporary exhibition spaces. Um, I haven't checked recently, but um, the Figgy had a long-term loan with the 25 pieces that we saved. Do you know anything? Did you were you involved in anything with uh, Hurricane Sandy? And do you know anything about you know, museums, institutions that were in its path? Um, we've got we've got several claims that are ongoing for um, Sandy. The biggest one we have is not a museum, it's actually an artist. And I think it's timely for us to talk about this because um, artists need to understand if they're a policyholder, they have rights. And we're working with an artist uh, right now named Dustin Yellen. And um, his dealer is um, uh, Julian Schnabel's son. And he has works that are selling for $100,000 a piece. They're gla fused glass sculptures with, um, with uh, sort of Tony Fitzpatrick's kind of elements that they cut out and they, and they, they form these sort of uh, interesting mosaics between glass. And they're life-size pieces. But um, when when Hurricane Sandy came through, he's in Brooklyn at Sandy Hook, and uh, they were probably uh, six, seven, eight feet underwater, and um, they had no no electricity, no gas, no heat, and the pieces were too large to move. So we got brought into um, there you go. We got brought in by actually his broker. And um, we went in because we understand the policies. See the life-size ones, Paul, that are red? They look like human figures. There you go. Those are life-size. Those are fabulous pieces. They weigh a ton. Um, but we were brought in. A lot of times we get hired by insurance companies. And in this case, his insurance company is not a primary fine art uh, company. There are there are probably five main companies that are really good at insuring fine art, and there's maybe three or four brokerages that are good insuring fine art. Everybody else are secondary or tertiary players, and in this case, Dustin did not have a good policy. He has a. We just got done doing his physical inventory. He has a, roughly a 4.75 million dollar claim on a policy that's about two million. So we're working on his behalf to try to find additional cover for him. But until we got involved in it uh, and knowing the policy and knowing his rights on a claim, we were able to get an advance for him. We were able to get uh, vendors to come in and uh, give us generators, bring us gasoline, uh, get us lights. Otherwise, there were parts of Brooklyn that were still without power a couple weeks ago. Well, let's get to some, I don't know if this is also mundane, but let's deal with some specifics here. Um, how much art should an artist have or how much art should that, how much value should that art have for them to know they should have an insurance policy? That's a good question. It, the, good, the good thing right now, insurance is cheap. It's really cheap. And um, it's very competitive now. Uh, you can get really good prices. Um, I think that if an artist is, is to a point where they've had gallery exhibitions, they've had sales, and they're still obviously creating art, then to me, they should have insurance. And, and they should, uh, you know, find a broker who can um, match them with a policy. A lot of times, uh, this policy that Dustin has is not a policy for an artist. 
and there are products out there that are for artists or are for galleries or for, for museums or private collectors. So you have to make sure you have the right policy. A lot of times people will add things to their homeowner's insurance. And if your homeowner's is State Farm or, you know, someone who's really good at homes, they're not good at art. So you, you really want to make sure you're with a good company that will insure the art. And you don't have to necessarily have it on a schedule, too. That's kind of a misnomer. First of all, well, let's back up. Let's define some terms here, Bob. I, I mean, a homeowner's policy is sufficient to what extent and why, why would you choose a homeowner's policy? Why do I choose a homeowner's policy instead of having it scheduled in a, you know, and, um, and what does scheduled mean? But why, you know, what, how much coverage do you have with your basic homeowner's policy? The problem with a basic homeowner's policy, most U.S. homeowner's policies have exclusions or limits on jewelry, on cash, and on art. So, um, you know, I was just looking at a domestic policy today where it's really good cover for anything that's not art, but for art, it clearly says the exclusion is we won't pay more than $2,500 total. So if you have $500,000 and you have the wrong policy and the exclusion and limit is 2,500, then it's really a waste to have that policy. <coughs> I better so, deal with that. Say that again? I better deal with that. Yeah, you should call me. Um, the thing about homeowners is, for instance, Chubb is Chubb is a domestic company, and Chubb is considered the Cadillac of insurance companies, but they're very expensive. You pay for what you get. I'm I'm insured with Chubb. My my personal collection is insured with Chubb, and it's on a schedule. Now, a Come schedule, out to find schedule. A schedule is basically a really nice word for an Excel spreadsheet that everything is itemized line by line. In the insurance world, you have two types of cover. You have blanket or you have schedule. So a schedule is actually an inventory that lists the name of the artist, the title, the medium, dimensions, value, et cetera. So if I have a schedule that's north of a million dollars and I submit it to an insurance company, then they will quote it for those agreed values. So if I have a loss, they will pay me what is on that itemized schedule. So if I have a Dustin Yellen for $100,000 and that piece gets stolen, then they will pay me $100,000 less my deductible. Now, some insurance say, companies. Go ahead, Bob. Some insurance companies have thresholds for appraisals. So, for instance, Chubb will say any work of art over $50,000 has to have an independent appraisal. So as long as I have an independent appraisal that um, then I submit to them and they approve through underwriting, then they will pay me that amount. Anything less than that, I don't need appraisals. You said earlier that rates for insurance, art insurance coverage are cheap. Um, is this based on a percentage of value? Yeah, basically the the underwriting is done off an actuary table, they take into account where the risk is. If it's a coastal risk, California, Florida, it's going to be more expensive because of more exposures. But in general, they're looking at the dollar amount. And so when I got into this business, a museum was paying 25 cents per thousand for insurance. Now it's about two cents. And that shows you how dramatically the prices dropped. Two cents per thousand. What percent is that? 0 0.02? Yeah. But the other thing about museums is they 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 grossly underinsure on purpose because they can't afford to insure the entire collection. So if an artist arbitrarily has a hundred thousand dollars first of all, if if you're an artist, are you insuring it at wholesale or retail or what? Um it, that's called basis evaluation. And it's important to know that some insurance products offer different basis of valuation. So it's important to make sure you get the right basis of value. Um, everything in the insurance world, except for art and maybe 
stamps and coins and high-end automobiles tend to appreciate. Those things appreciate. Everything else in the world depreciates. Insurance adjusters have a book called the Standard Depreciation Table that if I was doing a claim on your refrigerator that was damaged in a fire, that standard depreciation table will tell me that your refrigerator has a life expectancy of, let's say, 20 years. So when I ask you how old that refrigerator is and you say 10 years, there is a 50% depreciation based on actual cash value. Replacement cost or the insurance side for fine art, it should be at the retail price because um, that is the highest basis you can get. You don't want to do it at your cost level because if you are exhibiting with a gallery and they're taking 50% or whatever their cut is, uh, I would insure it at full retail. Now, there are artist specific products out there that AXA and some other insurance companies sell, they usually will only insure, insure at 50% of retail, understanding that 50-50 split between the artist and the uh, dealer. All right, you guys start raising hands if you got some questions. Um, I want to go back to, I remember, I remember um, a Rothko that had sold at a, an auction in New York and had been sent to a client, and the client complained that it wasn't in the condition when he or she received it that it was when it sold or when he previewed it at the auction house. Do you remember the story? Uh, I'm, I'm listening. I have to tell your story? Yeah, it's better when you tell it. <laughs> so you went and did an inspection of the Rothko, and the client complained this is ridiculous. And the client complained about scratches in the upper right hand corner or something like that and various kind of marks. And you pulled out the condition report that the auction house used and recorded when the painting arrived on its premises or before it was shipped to the auction house. Right. And the exact things that the purchaser collector was wanting to get compensated for were right there on the condition report. As evidenced by the, so that meant that they were that way when the client right. bought the piece, yep. and therefore he was entitled to nothing. Exactly. Good exactly. story, Bob. Thank you. It's a uh, great story. <laughs> Old for generations. Okay, who's got questions? Annette has a question. Hold on, Annette. Okay, Annette, go ahead. Hi, I just wondered if uh, these either fascinating stories. Thank you very much for uh, for talking. And a, a little louder and or a little closer, please. These are fascinating stories, so thank you for talking with us. Um, you've been very careful not to mention individual insurance companies. So uh, can you just suggest how we would find one that is a specialist in insuring art? Um, that's a really good question. And, and the thing to keep in mind with insuring art, there's two elements. <clears throat> excuse me, there's the broker or agent, which is the person that is your liaison between you and the insurance company. So you need to have a broker, and then the second thing is the insurance company. Um, right now, the, the the primary brokers out there are uh, Marsh, um, Aon, which is also Huntington T. Block. There's, Wait, let's uh, spell some things. Marsh is M-A-R-S-H. Yeah. Um, a -N, a, -N, a, -N, a N and Huntington and Block is Huntington Block. So that was Mr. Block, sold his business to Aon. There's, okay. Will there's Willis, W-I-L-L-I-S, and uh, another company called DeWitt Stern based out of New York, but everybody has a New York, Chicago, Los Angeles office. Those are the, the main players, and the main insurance companies, um, Lloyd's, of London, so all of these brokers can access Lloyd's. <coughs> Excuse me, Lloyd's, uh, Chubb, Fireman's Fund, Travelers, AXA is really not my favorite, but AXA does fine art insurance. Those those are the main ones that I would look at for products for artists. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's go to the bottom alphabetically. Sal, go ahead. Actually, my question was the same. 
that everybody there may be other same ones okay Sal thanks um Jen your turn hi um my first question is uh, about insurance for artists for their art studio complexes any advice about that um the same group of brokers and insurance companies can offer that product because your studio your, your fine art's going to fall under a fine art cover, the coverages, but your studio that would be in a building is going to go under uh, a uh, pack, a commercial package policy so that you can get cover for liability and get cover in the event of fire or theft or any other peril for your studio. Does that make sense? Hold on. I muted her because I heard some echoing stuff. Okay, Jen, go ahead. Um. So when you say commercial package liability, that doesn't imply that we should be cooperating with each other for our insurance, does it? Not that I can't cooperate with them, but. You mean co-op? Or what do you mean cooperate? I don't understand. I mean, uh, should we be using the same insurance? Uh, should we have some sort of package together or that's simply the term? When you say we, you mean other people who share the studio space, the studio building, et cetera? Is that who you mean we? Yeah, there's 26 uh, studios there. I mean, you, you probably you could probably do that if a, if one of the insurance companies would be interested in in writing it, you might get a better price because um, be, I think one one company would be interested in that. I think you would have more power negotiating price with them. Okay. Um, also, anything to say about. Um, if you go in for a group show and uh, they claim no insurance, is that just your responsibility then to always have insurance on your work? That's a very good question. I I I always believe in in first party insuring or first party claims handling. In insurance, it's either first party or third party. So I own a gallery. So if, if you are going to exhibit in my gallery, I have insurance and. I'm I'm a believer in insurance, and I would I would take your work on consignment with a consignment agreement, and I would I would give you a certificate of insurance to prove to you that I have insurance. Um, I'm always suspicious of dealers who don't want to cover your artwork while it's in their care, control, and custody. But you should always have insurance in the event the cert could be they could lie to you and tell you they have insurance, and then they don't. Because insurance really is there in the event you have a loss. And if you have a loss, you may want to put the claim under your own insurance company instead of the dealers. Because a lot of times I find that dealers keep artists out of the claims process and may not fully represent to you the damage to your artwork or maybe not even fully compensate you under the terms of their policy. So it's always important to have your own insurance to protect you, but galleries who don't offer to cover is a red flag to me. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you too, Jen. Bob, listen to this. I'm reading now from the Illinois Consignment of Art Act. This is solely for the state of Illinois, unless you guys are elsewhere, and I wouldn't be surprised if California has similar things. Under the act, a dealer, this is the law I'm reading. Under the act, a dealer will be held strictly liable for damage to or loss of the work. Liability attaches upon delivery and continues for 30 days after the contractual removal date. Absent a date for, et cetera. Okay, so what that means is that if you can sign your art to a gallery, an exhibition, or whomever, they are legally responsible for damage to that artwork. However, the act does not require dealers to ensure all works of art in their possession. Artists must independently inquire about insurance cover for each gallery. Furthermore, artists should discover the limits of their own homeowners or renters insurance. Um, you know, Bob, this brings up the interesting case. I, I, I don't know if you guys know this or not. In 1989, anniversary is coming up. Um, I had a gallery that was 100% destroyed by fire. And um, I believe that there were 10 galleries in the building, all of which suffered a 100% loss. 
And the gallery happened, the, excuse me, the fire started on Saturday, April 15th at 6 o'clock in the morning. Two days before that, on Thursday, April 13th, there had been a small fire in the building, and I went, oh, my God, we're at risk. Friday afternoon, I followed my art dealer's intuition, um, and I called up my insurance agent, um, and I said, I want to double my insurance. And that was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he said, okay, fine, you're covered. Bob, that was John Harney. And um, the fire happened like 15 hours later. I knew that at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Chicago when I said double my insurance and they said okay, um, that I didn't – actually, I didn't know for sure. that The first question when I reached my agent Saturday morning during the fire – is, am I covered? And he said, yeah, we sent the thing to Lloyd's overnight. They got it. They haven't responded. You are covered. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stories to tell about that fire. About a month after the fire, I got a phone call from the Chicago police. And I said, no, thanks. I don't want to make the donation. I'm, I've already contributed. Thanks so much. And I said, no, Paul, you are a suspect. And I said, oh, good, because I went from being 40% covered to 80% covered. And they said, we'll get back to you. And um, they haven't yet. So, you know, it, this whole insurance thing, and I, I mean, I was really lucky because I trusted my intuition, and it covered my butt. And I was able to pay off all the artists whose artwork I had there, in part because I had a lot of owned inventory and it gave me, you know, essentially more coverage because I had coverage for that, too. Um, so I got, you know, sufficient compensation. And then, you know, we sued and we won that. Um, Jen asked what the act is called. I looked up Illinois um, Consignment of Art Act. You know, and, you know, something like that, you'll be able to find it. And if you're somewhere else, there must be a Consignment of Art Act in most enlightened states. And I wouldn't call Illinois all that enlightened. So, there's a, um, there's a, Paul, there's another act I want to make sure everybody is familiar. Um, th there's an act called VARA, V-A-R-A, and artists need to understand this. It stands for the Visual Artist Rights Act, and our dear friend Scott Hodes knows this act very well. Um, I've spoken on panels with Scott and, and with conservators about it. Basically, this has come out of the uh, artist rights and copyright issues in Europe that's been around for 100 years. And most European artists are very familiar with it. I've had, I've had claims with European artists <clears throat> who, once they hear a work has been conserved, they make a public statement that that's no longer their work, and they give it the kiss of death. American courts have now in New York started to um, hear lawsuits on VARA. And what the Visual Artist Rights Act says is that you as an artist, you own the copyright, you own the, the work, and if it's ever involved in a claim and an insurance company says, well, we can restore it, and if you do not approve it, then you have every right to say that is no longer my work and it's worthless. And it's something that artists need to understand they do have that right. And in insur during insurance claims, anytime I have a work of art that is from a living artist or a foundation or an estate, I always contact them and let them know we are doing conservation and make sure they understand so that we don't take a Roy Lichtenstein and use a conservator in New York to do a great job, but then the foundation says that's no longer Roy Lichtenstein. Um, so it's something that everyone needs to familiarize themselves with is the Visual Artist Rights Act. Cool. All right, Barry, you had a question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, this is... Very, very, a little closer, a little louder, if you would. A little confusing and a little, a little frustrating too. I, I built a studio behind my 
house and uh, I have a separate commercial policy for the studio. And every year I get um, a little query from the insurance company saying, you know, how much inventory you cover are you holding and what are your sales for the year and this and that, which haven't been too good lately, but this, the inventory fluctuates a lot through the course of a year. Uh, if, you know, if it burned down when everything was in the place, um, how do you prove, <laughs> do you have to contact them as you make stuff or do you have to keep a constant uh, tally sheet to send to them or how, it seems a little bit like, uh, I mean, I know you have to do the work to get the rewards, but it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of hoops. It, it, it's a really good question and may I ask who your insurance company is? Uh, rural Mutual. Well, there's your mistake right there. Okay, good to know. Um, seriously, I mean, I, I, you should not have to, you need to do an inventory um, because if you did have a fire, you need to know what your loss is and make sure when you have an inventory, you keep it in a secondary or third location because if the location burns down and you lose your inventory, then you're really in trouble. So the rule of thumb is keep it in a uh, off-premises location, keep it at a friend's house, parent's house, somebody else's house, so the chances of both burning down won't happen. But um, <coughs> it's really important to know that once you secure insurance, they'll, they'll want to know basically how much you have. So if you're with a Lloyd's policy and you had a schedule that you submitted to me, and it totals X, I would go to Lloyd's and say, you need insurance for the total amount. Once you have that policy, a Lloyd's policy is not gonna ask you every month, every week, what the fluctuation is. They will say that if your total amount, let's just pick a number, let's say it's 250,000 retail. That's the maximum amount of insurance you will ever have. So. If you go above it, you need to notify your broker to add, but if you stay under that and you buy, sell, and you make, and the inventory is moving around, as long as you know what you have in the event of a total loss fire, it doesn't matter once you have that sum insured. Now with a schedule I was talking earlier, schedules are hard to manage as an artist because your inventory is moving so much. An artist is better off to have not a schedule, but what would be a sum insured policy, the maximum amount they'll pay you. And as I mentioned before, a, a, a traveler's, a fireman's fund, a Chubb, Lloyd's, um, those are the people I would do your insurance with, not whoever you told me their name was. I've never heard of them, so. Oh, it's a Wisconsin company, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm glad you said, said that. I'll, I'll look into it. And the other thing I would say, to, to all of you is um, if you need help with insurance, feel free to contact me. Paul has all my contact information. Can um, I post it here, Bob? You can post it here. And um, we, we have recently added, uh, as of December 1st, we've added brokerage to what we do. So I have access to all the insurance markets. And so we've started to write artists. We've started to write small museums and private collections. So I tell people, as I've said before, you buy insurance in the event you have a claim. And most brokers are salespeople. They're selling shoes at Nordstrom's one day and then they're selling insurance. Um, I've been a claims adjuster and a risk manager for 25 years. And because you buy insurance in the event you have a loss, I feel that most of my clients want me to be their broker because they know I'll be their advocate in the claim situation. So I understand claims, understand insurance and underwriting. And I always feel bad for people when they have the wrong insurance company, an uneducated broker, specifically in art. A lot of people have friends who are brokers or they go to church with someone who's a broker, but unless they really know art, you really need to find somebody who can place you with the right insurance company with the right coverage, and someone like me who would say to you, Barry, I'm going to tell you how to read your policy so you understand what your coverage is in the event of a loss, and you understand where your duties and responsibilities are to maintain an inventory. Because I've, I've been an expert witness in federal and state courts, 
defending artists who have been sued by their own insurance company because the insurance company thinks you're committing fraud and they want to pull a David and Goliath on you and ground you up and spit you out. So I think artists need to understand what type of insurance they need or insurance is and make sure you have the right product. Because if you have the wrong product and you have a claim, it will be the worst nightmare you've ever had to live through. Yeah. I have one other kind of tangential question that sure. just came to me. Um, I was uh, represented by a gallery that went bankrupt and, you know, had a lot of sold inventory they didn't compensate the artist for. I don't have a ton into that. A lot of people had 10 times the value loss that I did, but that's nothing an insurance company would ever be involved in. It's in federal court still, but I doubt I'll ever see the money. Um, that's not necessarily true. There's several cases right now that have been pending and some that have gone through the Chicago or Illinois docket, which is um, if you have your own policy and you have a good fine arts policy, if it can be proven that it's theft, that the dealer had stolen from you, then you would that would be a covered peril. Some policies will say <coughs> what that gallery did was called conversion where they converted your art, your asset to cash and several policies don't cover it. So as a claims person, it's all in how you present the claim. So if there is no cover for conversion, then we would try to argue theft. And I've done that successfully for artists before. So you, you, you may have a possibility if you have your own insurance. But the policy will tell us whether or not you have cover for that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, we, we've got more questions, and I think we'll get to them because I think these are important. So, Annette, I'll get to you in a moment. But I want to say to all of you folks that having accurate inventory records is really, really wise and a really good habit. You know, someday you will leave this planet and you will leave a pile of art to somebody and they may be looking at your best painting and think it's a poster. Um, you know, so that if you have some kind of record, preferably with photographs, that, you know, so somebody can determine precisely what it is you have, they will be able to do much better justice to your art than if they are trying to guess. When I had a gallery, I had all kinds of people who would bring me things and say, I have a painting and it would be a print. I have a print and it would be a painting. Um, you know, lay folks don't, you know, it's a work of art and they find all those terms interming intermingle, minglable, interchangeable. Um, and um, so, you know, having inventory is a, is, is a really important thing. With that inventory record, you can then have you know, solid kinds of insurance coverage. There's quite a few people who have questions, I think. Now, those of you who have at, satisfied, take your hand down, okay? Annette, go ahead. Okay, um, I just wanted to ask on the uh, Visual oh. Artist Rights Act, what happens after the death of an artist if they're no longer there to disclaim their work if it's been conserved? Um, <laughs> it's 75, I believe it's 75 years after the death of the artist. That's what it is in Europe, and I believe that's what um, what it is. But I know that foundation, when a foundation or the estate is controlling the artist's work, that it does go beyond the death of an artist. And I'm I'm pretty sure it's 75 years. Thank you. You're welcome. My recollection is the same. Andrea. Hi, this might be off track, but I wonder if you can say anything about um, liability insurance for artists? Well, good question. Um, well, you can get liability insurance. Um, a lot of fine art U.S. carriers can package that together for you and give you liability. Um, my question, though, to you would be you're looking for liability for what? If your artwork falls on somebody and kills them? Basically, you know, for installation work or large-scale outdoor sculpture work. Then it, it, that, you would have to go to a fine art, one of the fine art carriers to do that because they will sell, they will sell you liability uh, for if you have a studio and you have premises, um, they'll sell you liability uh, for the installation, but you have to be clear to them what you're doing so they can underwrite it appropriately. 
but it is available as a product. It would be for specific work, not a blanket policy that you had for yourself. No, it wouldn't have. To, it would have to be for like if you're talking about you want liability for installation, that you would need to disclose that to them as opposed to just a blanket liability for a premises. Mm -hmm. um, like if you own property and you you have liability, um, that could cover anything from the postman slipping on your front doorstep and suing you. But in the art world, you have to make sure you're specifically saying, my liability is not just for the premises, but it's going to be for, you know, six installations a year for large scale sculpture or whatever specifically you're looking for, because that's a different underwriting mm -hmm. than the building. And those carriers that you listed, the Chubb and Travelers and Lloyds, they, they are sources for that? Yes. And the a good point with Lloyds, though, is <clears throat> They they will do liability for an artist installation, but they don't do general liability for buildings because they're oh. a, what's called a alien or foreign corporation. But they will do artist. All right, thank you. <coughs> You're welcome. Your door's open. Mindy, go ahead. Yes. Um, I've uh, I've looked at insurance on both sides uh, of the fence as a gallery owner and also as an artist and talked to many other gallery owners and a lot of them are very confused on the issue. So it was a great subject. Um, one thing that I came across was the fact that certain venues are a higher risk than other venues. Uh, I ran a gallery for a short time. It was also um, uh, a music production company at night and hosted concerts, but I wasn't there to watch the art. So. I had to really show that there was some kind of um, security for the art in order to insurance, insure what we had. So I'd like your perspective on how an insurer would evaluate, you know, the amount of risk involved for, to insure a gallery. Um, that's a good question. I, <clears throat> the, uh, the insurance company is, is really interested in the premises primarily. So in the scope of, me representing them and looking at the loss control, the the security of the building. We want to make sure that the building's secure, that people can't break in. We want to make sure there's an alarm system, there's fire protection. Um, but if there are other people that have access to the building, like you were saying, if you're sharing the building or the space with somebody else, it, it tends to fall out of the care control of you and, and care control of somebody else. Um, in your situation, they probably were concerned about making sure the work was secured to the wall so people couldn't just lift it off and walk away with it, or that people were throwing beers at it or or hanging from it and damaging it. So they're looking at they're looking at you specifically and, and you uh, exhibiting the art, <clears throat> but having control of the space as well. So when a shared space is a really difficult underwriting decision, yeah. um, but besides the premises, the greatest uh, risk that any underwriter has is transit. So they'll also look at if you move art, are you using an art handler or are you throwing it in a plastic tub from Home Depot and driving it in your own personal auto? Mm -hmm. So they really want to try to eliminate risk and in my experience, and nothing personal, Paul, but most dealers don't own their inventory. And so they cut corners a lot and they use, uh, you know, FedEx or UPS five day ground or seven day ground. And so that is putting the underwriter at risk. And so um, the, the more that you can control the space and control your employees and make sure the art doesn't fall off the wall. And when you sell art and you pack it, and then you ship it that either you're very good at it and competent at it um, or you're using art handlers, which I know is always an added expense. Did that you answer know, your question? Yeah, sort of in that situation, I always felt um, that there was so much risk beyond my control. I'd only did that for a short time because I felt like even though I had an insurance policy and the underwriter wasn't very wise to what was really going on there, right? I felt that any claim that I might put forth could be uh, questioned. So it was it was difficult 
to try to exist in that kind of environment, particularly because of the insurance issue. But thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Um, we might be done. Does anybody else have another question? They want? Oh, somebody. I think not. Sal, Sal, are you good? You have your hand up. You, Sal, are you okay? My question was related if, if there were some recommended names of insurance companies, which has well been covered. Okay, cool. Can you take your hand down then? Um, does anyone else have a question? Bob, I think this has been really wonderful. I, I, think this well, I do have one. Take it away. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about um, transportation of, of artwork. If you are shipping work to a show somewhere, um, is it best to opt for uh, carrier insurance or rely on your own policy or do both? Repeat that, Paul. I don't think I got all of it. Yeah, let's say you're you're you're, you're sending your work to a museum exhibit, and the museum says, um, "Do you want to use your own insurance, or do you want to use ours? What should you do? What should you do?" Um, I would always, in a museum specifically, I would always want to use their insurance, but I would always ask them for a uh, a certificate of insurance that identifies who their broker is. Who their insurance company is and what their limits are. Yeah, I totally agree. You got you got that, Sal? I did. Um, but what about if you're shipping the work, and um, is it worth then, you know, paying the premium from you know a carrier like UPS or FedEx or or some other uh, carrier for insurance with them, or is it best to rely on your own policy? Yep. I, I heard the beginning, Paul, but not the end. Let's say you're shipping a work of art. Who, who's, whose policy are you should you be using? For for museum exhibition, the same? Probably same museum, but let's say it's a gallery also. Why, why make it only a museum? Let's say you might be shipping it to a gallery. Well, the, um, the way that insurance tends to work is it's all based on care, control, and custody. So if 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 I'm the artist and I'm sending my work to another gallery or museum, once I pack it and then give it to an art handler or give it to UPS or FedEx or however it's going, it's no longer in my care, control, and custody. Ideally and traditionally, it once it leaves the artist, the receiver then should should. Uh oh, he froze. Hold on. Did we lose you, Bob? It's spinning. This is when I feel like a sports announcer at a, at a baseball game when it's when there's a rain delay. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. I fear we have lost our guest. Oh no. Yeah, I know. No. Yeah. I have a question. You had a question, MacArthur? Yes. And now Barry's spinning too. It's attacking the bees. Um, I have a question uh, concerning studio space in home. If um, you know, you have I have a space within my home, and it has a separate. It has an entrance um, inside and out. Um, in terms of policy, is that a complicated issue? I'm not sure of the answer. Bob, Bob, are you back now? Yeah, I, I lost my internet. It, it's what happens when you stay in a cheap motel. So what was the question? Okay, cool. Um, I don't remember because we went on to another question in your absence that I couldn't answer, and I, I tried to be you and I couldn't pull it off. Um, so wait a minute, I don't even... <laughs> the first one was about uh, insuring during shipment. Yeah, so you're sending something. That's it. Thanks. So you're sending a work of art to your a gallery and museum or exhibition space. Any one of those things. Whose insurance should you uh, you be comfortable using? I I would always the person who has care, control, and custody. It should be their insurance. 
So I would say whoever you're sending it to should ensure it in both directions so that you can ensure they received it on their end and then when they ship it back that you ensure that you received it safely. So I, I would use the um, gallery or the museum. Now, in my case, I'm helping somebody sell a Frank, Helen Frankenthaler painting that we hope to net the client $120,000. And we've determined between the dealer that I've consigned this to to sell it that it has a retail value of $150,000. So we ship the painting FedEx and we put it uh, to London and from uh, Michigan. And because I'm no longer, you know, retail in the business, I do not have that kind of insurance. So I asked the gallery to whom we were sending it if they would cover the insurance. And they said, yes, they would. They would put it on their insurance policy. And, you know, I'll end up by invariably doing the same thing, having it come back because I don't have the insurance and it's a service that they're um, comfortable um, providing. Um, so they John, did, you have a question. They didn't. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sal, go ahead. I didn't say anything. I was just um, thinking along this line, though. If uh, let's say you are actually delivering the work instead of shipping it, you know, load up uh, my vehicle and drive a bunch of work down to Los Angeles, for example, um, would I be best covered then by? Um, an artist policy, or is this something that I have talked by auto policy about? And then, Bob? Yeah, I heard that. Um, auto policy is going to be tough, especially since it's fine art. There might be some exclusions. Um, you know, if, if, if the peril was theft, if you had parked the car, gassed it, ran in to use the restroom, came back, and they stole all your paintings or stole all your art, uh, it probably would not be covered under your auto, and then it would revert to your homeowners, and your homeowners would have a cap or limit on your fine art. So I would say a fine arts policy, whether it's a pure artist product or or a collect a collection policy that could be used uh, for an artist. But when you look at when you look at the policy, you know we talked about a schedule versus a non-schedule and talked about basis of valuation, you also want to look at transit. All policies will have a sum insured, which is the maximum amount they will pay, and a sublimit is your transit. So you always want to make sure you never transport more than what your transit limit is, and you got to make sure that there's uh, not exclusions in the policy for transit as to how you can transport. In a Lloyd's policy, they say that artwork has to be packed by a competent person. Um, so th most dealers get covered that way. I don't know why, Paul. So did that answer your question? Did that oh, I'm, I'm, go ahead. Did I answer the I'm question? I'm going to say it did answer his question. Okay. Okay. All right, MacArthur, you had a question. Go ahead. Yes, I have two, uh, two questions now. Um, my workspace is located in my home, and um, I have access for as well inside as well as there's exterior entrance and exiting from my workspace. Um, would that make a insurance policy complicated uh, in the way that it might be an office in my home? Uh, uh, no, I don't think you would have an issue of a, an office in your home. Do you have other employees? No. Or is it just you? It's your office. Yes. It's uh, my it's my art studio in my home. Okay. No, I don't see that. I don't see that as a problem. Okay. Uh, the other part is. Um, I have been shipping work from my framer and it is crated and I ship it to clients of, of, around the country. Um, should I then have my own independent policy 
I've just been relying on the um, policy from from the shipper that's creating it and shipping it. Do you know what the limits are for the um, for the framer, the crater? I mean, do you know for a fact they have enough insurance to cover your artwork in the event of a loss? To answer that truthfully, I would say no. I have been assuming. And I appreciate, I, you, I, I, I appreciate you being honest because you know what happens when you assume. Yes. And I, I, I specify an amount, Bob. Okay. But do you, but see, the, the thing is, is, for instance, you could ship something, you could pack it or have your framer pack it and ship it by FedEx, which people do all the time. And you could say, I'm going to declare to FedEx that uh, the value of that shipment is $50,000. Yes. So you feel that you've done the right thing, you've declared it, uh, you assume you have coverage. Well, FedEx has limits on fine art for shipping. And oh, so it's like 60 cents a pound or something. Well, that, yeah, that's their limits of liability, but the maximum that they will insure is $5,000. So, okay. so you say, I declared 50, and that's great, but then the limits of liability, as Paul said, on the back of the contract say it's either 30 cents per pound with a maximum of $30 or 60 cents per pound, maximum of $60 on a, on a way bill, but you just wasted your money and you don't have coverage. Yeah. So I, 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 I would want someone to show me and that's where a certificate of insurance comes in, that if I was your framer and I'm creating and shipping and you say to me, Bob, I need a certain, my, my insurance guy says, I need a certificate of insurance. All that is is a one page document filled out by their broker that verifies coverage. It's a standard form. So if they, him and Han and say, well, I can't get it for you, that should be a red flag that they really don't have the coverage that you assume you have. Okay. If you had your own policy for transit, then you would be covered that way. It doesn't cost anything for the insured to provide a certificate of insurance. He calls up his okay. broker and says, I needed something that says MacArthur's Arts covered in shipment, send me a certificate, you know, and he'll get one in the email or snail mail in a day. Yep. Okay. And there's no fee for that for anybody. So if they tell you something else, that's Bob's red flag. Let's take Excellent. let's take one more question, and that's with John, who's tonight going by Joe. Yeah, John. Hey, I've got uh, probably is a very, a very simple or a very stupid question, but I'm good at those. Um, I'm a very famous artist, but at this point, my art is worth nothing. It's worthless. Are there any reasons I should be anything I should be thinking about that might? Is there any reason I might need insurance? Um, that's a good question. Um, insurance is really passing the risk off to somebody else, to a third party. I mean, people self-insure all the time. Major institutions, uh, countries uh, self-insure. So if you want to not have insurance and if you are comfortable with the people who pack and ship your work, if it's you or somebody else, I mean, you can risk manage the situation to the point where insurance could conceivably be a waste of money. The only time that insurance is going to help you is when you take it out of your care, control, and custody and you send it to, you know, a gallery and the gallery burns to the ground. And if you self-insure, you get nothing. So my question is, is maybe a little more simpler than that. If, I have a lot of work, but it's not worth anything. If it's lost, I have to start all over again. So I don't think there's any way to put any kind of value on it, is there? Well, understand? yeah, I mean, so just, I don't know if we're talking hypothetical, but when you say your work is not worth anything, have you exhibited your work? Have you made any sales? No, no just it's in a vault. And it's in a vault... Uh, he, he, he just jumped in. He's like new. So he's making drawings predominantly on 8 by 10 sheets of paper, maybe a little bit larger. 
their drawings and he does, they're quick and he has many, 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 many of them and he hasn't exhibited nor sold any yet. Right, should okay. I bother to try to insure him is what I'm saying. Well, I, I've, I've handled claims before with artists who have never exhibited before and the, the, the task is to figure out what to compensate them. Yeah. So you could be compensated for, if you have no price list or anything, you could still have insurance that the basis of valuation could be your cost to recreate. So that if you spend, yeah. you know, a, a, a month, a year, an entire lifetime, and you lose everything, then you could be compensated for the cost to recreate. Okay. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, there's no point in trying to ensure something that doesn't have a value yet. Are you planning on exhibiting your work and selling your work? Yeah, yeah. Who knows well, if anybody will ever like it, you know. It's like, so I understand. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bob, thank you. God. Also, before I, you know, wrap this up with you, I want to, there's a book that I wrote down, a wonderful book called Provenance, P-R-O-V-E-N-A-N-C-E, -E, which was about an English artist gentleman who liked trying to see how well he could make reproductions and give them away to friends. And some art dealer without the appropriate amount of scruples heard about this guy and ended up having make, and make forgery after forgery and paying him all this kinds of money. And it's it, it, it's a page turner. I mean, you cannot put this book down. I think I read it in two days. Um, Provenance, and it's the author, there's two authors, Lainey Salisbury and Ali Suho. And actually, I know Ali Suho's mom. Um, let me see if I got this here. So this is on Amazon. This book is just a real, real pleasure to read on parts of what we've discussed. Bob, I think the information that you shared has been really wonderful. You have broken the record for the longest webinar out of about 140 or 150 that I've done. Um, and I think it's been really pleasant um, and really valuable and really insightful. And it's a compliment to you that we've gone all that time. Thanks a ton. For, I mean, this was, I thought, much more valuable. And I mean, I know you're interesting, but I found it more valuable than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Sorry, guys. And it's been wonderful. Let me unmute everybody so we can all say thank you. Bob. Thank you. Bob. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Really valuable. Fair. Thank you. When in doubt, pick up the phone. <laughs> Hello. See you. See you.